Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Middle East Matters. I'm Julia Kim. Coming up in the program. A new escalation in Yemen's seven-year civil war. Residents in the capital, Sana'a, fear for their lives as attacks multiply between the Saudi-led coalition and Iran-backed Houthi rebels. Intercommunity violence in Israel. The number of gang-related murders skyrocket among Israeli Arabs. The government promising to do more as families blame police in action for endemic violence. And also in the show, France 24's jihadi movements expert Wasim Nasser unpacks last week's brazen prison break by Islamic State militants in Syria. But first, residents of Yemen's capital Sana'a are bracing themselves for more airstrikes amid a new escalation in the country's seven-year war. Last week, Saudi-led warplanes killed at least 90 people at a detention centre in the rebel-held Sadar province. While Iran-backed Houthi rebels have also multiplied attacks on coalition partners, France 24 Selena Sykes reports. Fear and uncertainty have long been a part of people's lives in Sana'a. Though after seven years of civil war, many are starting to feel close to breaking point. Ahmed and his family live near a military academy targeted in a recent airstrike which shattered their home's windows and damaged the walls. Our lives have changed after this bombing, this aggression led by the Gulf countries, the UAE and Saudi Arabia. They destroyed our lives. Where do we go? To the street? Our homes and cars are destroyed. We've become homeless. The capital, held by Iranian-backed Houthi rebels since 2014, had seen relative calm since 2020, while fighting flared up elsewhere in Yemen. But violence has intensified over the past week after an airstrike on a detention centre which killed at least 80 people, leaving residents increasingly on edge. We are afraid day and night. You don't know when the strikes will happen. The homes of citizens are now military targets, and that is what scares us. You're also scared that you'll be hit while taking your children to school or at the hospital. Business is also being affected. Customers are scared, so we leave early, close our stores and go home to make sure our children are safe. The United Nations estimates that 377,000 people had died by the end of 2021, since war first broke out in Yemen in late 2014. More than 4 million people have been displaced, while much of the population stands on the brink of famine. Intercommunity violence among Arabs is soaring in Israel. In 2021, a gang-related gang crime wave claimed the lives of 128 Israeli Arabs, a record number which includes women and children caught in the crossfire. The victims' families accuse the police of neglect. The government, though, has promised to do more. Iris Makler sent us this report from Kalanswa, a town located in Israel's centre, where criminals have formed a state within a state. These two women lost their children on the same night last year. 19-year-old Lais attended a party held by her neighbour, 20-year-old Mohammed. Then two gunmen arrived. They entered through here. They opened the door. You can still see the traces of the bullets. They waved their gun barrels around the room and started shooting. They opened fire randomly without knowing who they were aiming at, who was going to live, who was going to die, they didn't care. The assassins fled. Lais and Mohammed died instantly. The women know the murderers, two brothers affiliated with organised crime who had a dispute with Mohammed. A few months earlier, they'd shot at the house. It's not the first time they've come and the police haven't done anything. After they shot at our house, the police came. They noted the position of the bullets. They put up a barrier and that's all. Thank you, bye. Everyone warned them and they didn't protect us. They are police only in name. We don't know anything about the case. We don't even know if there's a case at all. We are part of the state of Israel and the state must enforce our rights. 128 Israeli Arabs lost their lives in gangland violence last year. Only a fraction of the killers were prosecuted. The Israeli government now says it intends to act, allocating more than 600 million euro to the task. But the gangs remain powerful, as police in Kalanswa discover. 
This morning, a police unit's going out on a raid. We have several targets, influential criminals in the Arab districts. You have to search the places outlined in the briefing well. For several months, the unit has been collecting intelligence on weapons stashes here. They searched two houses thoroughly. In an empty lot nearby, they make their first discovery. These are explosives. The bomb squad is coming. Criminals use this to intimidate innocent people in the city. Police remove the explosives watched by residents. Back at the station, they lay out their haul of cannabis and weapons. The lead detective says he's a bit disappointed. It's good work, but it's not our biggest catch. Police say there are 500,000 firearms circulating in a community of less than 2 million. Weapons sometimes come from the Palestinian Authority. Sometimes they're imported from foreign countries. There are thefts. There are also homemade weapons. So when we act against traffickers, it cuts off the supply. There is an increased police presence, but the shootings continue. Six people have been killed in Israeli Arab towns since the new year, including a four-year-old boy. Syrian Kurdish forces say they've forced at least 300 Islamic State fighters to surrender this week after the militants orchestrated a prison break last Thursday. The group's attempt to free its members from the facility in northeastern Syria led to dozens of deaths. Now, the Syrian Democratic Forces, spearheaded by the Kurdish YPG militia, said they're planning to flush out those still hiding within the complex in Hasaka city. Well, France 24's jihadi movement specialist Wasim Nasser joins us on set. Wasim, let's go over the facts first. I mean, what's happened since last Thursday in Al Sinar prison? Well, actually, the fight uh, was ignited uh, last Thursday in a dual way. There was a mutiny inside of the prison, and there was an attack from outside of the prison with two suicide, two suicide attackers with car bombs. Uh, uh, igniting their charges next to the walls of the prison. So it happened in, in this, at the same time, and there was crews of the Islamic State attacking uh, the uh, gardens of the prison and even uh, posted on the road towards the prison, meaning to stop any, uh, any other YPG uh, fighters from reaching the prison. This is how it began. So they controlled part of the facility, part of the prison, and you can see how it uh, unfolded inside the facility. They broke out of their cells and then into the prison, the yard of the prison, and then even out of the prison. And here we see the last uh, fights that happens in the few, uh, few hours back. And we see them inside the prison, but still out of their cells and fighting the APG, who was forced, which was forced to bring into the fight uh, heavy machine guns and uh, troop transports that we're going to see. So it's a really big fight. Uh, uh, U.S. helicopters joined, Apache helicopters, jet fighters joined, and even in the last hours, uh, U.S. special forces joined the fight. So they broke out even out of the prison. And they controlled some of the streets and some buildings around the prison. And this is why the fight is taking that long, and this is why it is very hard to unroot them from this, uh, from this facility, since they were able to capture arms, ammunition, enough to make them hold all this time. I mean, looking at the scale of this attack and the fact that the operation has taken several days and is still in some ways ongoing, mm. does it seem as though the Islamic State group is making something of a comeback in Syria? Well, I wouldn't say that. It's uh, actually it's a proof that they are able to coordinate and organize complex attacks, knowing that they tried to attack the prison back in November, two months ago, but the plot was foiled uh, on time by the Kurdish forces helped by the US and the car bomb was uh, was destroyed way before it went out of the of the hideout. So the, the APG or the Kurdish forces should have been aware that this is uh, was going to repeat and to happen again, knowing that the Islamic State has a, one of these aim objectives is to free its own, either in Iraq, Syria, or as far as Congo, in Beni, they broke a prison uh, last, uh, last year. So this is part of what they do, actually. And they will use it for propaganda uh, ends. They will use it in order to say they are still there. But I don't think that we are in the same dynamic as it was in Syria and Iraq a few years back, where they freed their own and they went step uh, right away towards territorial control. So the thing is today for them is just to hold as much as they can. And it's enough for them.
Now, there are fears over the fate of the prisoners. There are some 850 minors, many of whom are mm. foreign nationals, who are detained there. What do we know about what's happened to them? Well, actually, we don't know. Today, they are in the middle of this fight, but we shouldn't forget that they've been there since years now, you see? So today, when some spokes of the Kurdish factions say that they are holding back their firepower only to protect those children, we know it's not true. On one hand, those children shouldn't have been there. Maybe they should have been in specialized facilities, not in a prison uh, like this. And on the other hand, we know that Kurdish factions tried everything to take over uh, the prison. It didn't succeed for more than a day. So we shouldn't, they shouldn't be justifying the security failure in this facility that should have been one of the most secured in Syria by saying, well, we didn't go uh, very far in firepower not to protect the children. Thank you very much for your analysis on this uh, developing story. Thank we you. appreciate it. Next, former Lebanese Prime Minister Saad Hariri has announced he's retiring from politics and will not run in May's election. He's also called on his future movement party, the country's largest Sunni parliamentary bloc, to boycott the vote. Hariri's decision to end his turbulent 17-year career plunges crisis-ridden Lebanon into further uncertainty. I am convinced there is no room for any positive opportunity for Lebanon due to Iranian influence, international upheaval, national division, sectarianism and the collapse of the state. And finally, five Roman artifacts from the ancient city of Palmyra have been returned to Syria by Lebanon's Nabu Museum. The limestone statues had been on display there since uh, 2018 before a private Lebanese collector decided to give them back. Dating back to the 2nd and 3rd century, they were acquired from European auction houses before the Syrian war broke out in 2011. During the conflict, the Islamic State group destroyed or looted a number of priceless monuments in Palmyra. And that brings us to the end of this edition of Middle East Matters. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned for more world news coming up here on France 24.